So I'm going to be talking a little bit, as I say, about Collider Bias in a sense. I should explain. Um, we are recording the first 20 to 30 minutes um, because um, I'm going to be talking about uh, UK Biobank, a particular um, cohort uh, that in the UK has received um, tens of millions um, of pounds of funding, uh, has at least, um, I think, around a thousand publications um, indexed plus on Medline, uh, on PubMed. Um, and there is a message that we have tried many times to get out about Biobank, uh, about UK Biobank, and nobody seems to be listening. So um, our solution is to, as ever, continue to turn up the temperature and hope um, that that creates a response. So to recap from yesterday, Collider bias is a form of non-causal um, association that is created when we condition on a collider. And it can create these mind-boggling paradoxes when you have um, quite severe associations going on and being introduced. Um, it will commonly affect multivariable um, regression models, where there are several different variables being um, mutually adjusted, as people might say, um, because we end up with a table two fallacy, where various variables are mediators for other variables, and therefore by conditioning on them, we open these, these, mediation, uh, these um, backdoor paths, these strange conditional dependencies. So we can try and avoid collider bias in our modeling by not doing that, by choosing the appropriate adjustment set for the S demand that we're interested in. But there are other situations where it's not as simple as that, where we can't just not make a mistake, we have to actually think about what's going on um, in our data. And even in the situation where it is unsolvable, where the collider bias is, is it's, it's completely impossible to do anything about, there is still an enormous benefit to knowing about the type of bias you have in those data and how it may be affecting um, your, um, uh, your research. So I said I was going to start today by talking about Bertson's bias or Bertson's paradox as a, as a specific example. Um, and the example of Bertson's um, bias is one where we have um, the relationship of interest is between diabetes and having severe urinary tract infections. And this being the modern world, it's reasonable in this thought experiment that this is something we would want to explore in hospital admission data. This is, you know, this is big data, it's routinely available. Nobody will fund us to do a traditional study anymore. You know, you just need to look at this, the, this available data within hospitals. And say, you know, how much more common are urinary tract infections um, in people with diabetes than in everyone else? Well, we have a problem, which is that there are, these are actually two competing reasons for attending hospital. So if you imagine diabetes is one reason you could go to hospital and severe urinary tract infection is another reason that you could go to hospital, then when we look in hospital records, we have conditioned um, on a collider. The collider is selection, it is presence within that data set. So immediately, by looking in those records, we will have a conditional dependency between um, diabetes and severe urinary tract infection. There's nothing we can do, because that is the nature of the data. Um, and so, uh, according to the Bertson's bias kind of um, uh, thought experiment, we would expect to see a protective effect of severe um, uh, of diabetes on severe urinary tract infection, because severe urinary tract infection is a very common reason for going to hospital. And so, a lot of people are going to hospital for severe urinary tract infection. Um, and if you have diabetes, there's plenty of other reasons that you could go to hospital other than having a severe urinary tract infection. So you'd probably end up with the inverse association to what you would expect. So we say now that Bergson's paradox or Bergson's bias is a classic example of collider bias, where co the collider is selection into the study. And because the sample is restricted, 
inherently restricted, um, then we have, uh, you know, we have implicitly conditioned and implicitly introduced um, collider selection bias, or whatever we're going to call it. And this kind of bias can um, be introduced from a number of different causes. We can have the sampling strategy. So exactly who did you decide, or, or which groups did you decide to sample into your, um, into your study? It can happen due to differential participation. So different types of people like to participate in research. It can happen due to differential attrition. So this is when you have a study population to begin with, who drops out? They drop out in a differential way, again, we will have um, selection bias. And it can happen due to missing data, depending on the anal analytical approach we then use. Because if we simply analyzed everyone with complete data, well, it's likely that, again, there'll be some kind of differential reason why some people are missing and others are not. So this is why we say that we could just describe this problem in general as a bias of there are competing reasons why we have data on somebody versus we do not have data. And therefore, as soon as we have data, there is likely to be some bias between the different reasons that we have that data and everything correlated with that. And we call this informed presence bias. The fact that they are in our data is informative. In, its, in, in itself. It's not a random process. I mean, it certainly makes sense with every, every single health data set you can imagine. The people who go to their GP within the last year are different to the people who don't. <clears throat> so the obvious example of this problem is a retrospective study, a case control study. Um, so this is where you have, as we know, uh, just to explain to those who don't know, in a case control study, what you do is you start by identifying a number of people with, say, a disease, and then you find another, a number of um, references. Um, so not entirely people without the disease, but just people at risk of the disease. And then you try and get some historical information about them to find out whether there's any differences in that historical information in terms of their uh, disease between the disease groups. And what we know about case control studies is that cases are considerably more likely to participate. Because in general, if you're approached and you have a disease and someone says, do you want to be in a study about your disease? Then yes, you're interested. But if you don't have the disease and somebody says, do you want to be in a study about this disease? Not really, not, not particularly interesting to me. So we have an immediate kind of structural bias um, that's affecting the relationship between participation and your outcome. So now all you need is a imbalance in the participation and the exposure and you're going to end up with bias. One of the things in general we know is that minority ethnic groups are less likely to participate in research, which is generally conducted by the white majority, um, than the white majority. So we can therefore expect a selection bias because if we were looking at the relationship between ethnicity and an outcome in a case control study, because let's pick any outcome, in this case bowel cancer, well we know that the cases are more likely to participate. So in this situation now, we know that minority ethnic groups are less likely to participate. We know that people with bowel cancer are more likely to participate, we would expect a selection bias, such that the risk of bowel cancer would appear larger in minority ethnic groups. So there is an old kind of belief uh, that case control studies tend to give larger effects um, than cohort studies, and I think it's generally understood now to be an artifact of this um, selection process. But when you actually think about the determinants of participation, it becomes a little bit scary. Because willingness and ability to participate in research is determined by almost everything you can imagine, or at least it is correlated with almost everything you can imagine. It's certainly um, correlated and determined by health, 
you know, are you physically or psychologically well enough to, to fill in this survey or to attend this, this uh, data collection? Um, your education, this is, you know, are you interested in that? Do you have curiosity? Your beliefs, do you, um, your religious beliefs, your spiritual beliefs, your political beliefs, do you trust um, researchers in general or are they part of the system? Your, your psychology, your personality. I and mean, then, of course, economics. Do you have time? Can you afford it if there's some kind of um, cost barrier to taking part? So participation bias is massive. Willingness just to volunteer, which leads to self-selection bias, to respond to invitations, which leads to non-response bias, to provide consent, which we call consent bias, to remain involved in the study, which we call attrition bias, and to participate completely, which we call missing data bias, are generally lower in men, older people, poorer people, less educated people, people in poorer health, people from ethnic minorities. In general, the more marginalized, the less likely you are to participate. And the one exception is that in, ret in retrospective studies, particularly case control studies, cases are more likely um, than non-cases. But what about prospective studies? As I've alluded to, um, the traditional thinking is that actually prospective studies are considerably more resilient to the problems of selection bias than retrospective studies. And I'm going to focus on the example of UK Biobank. Right? And there's several reasons why I'm going to focus on that. One of them is that it's one of the most prominent cohort studies in the UK. A lot of money has been pumped into UK Biobank. But more importantly is that UK Biobank for many years has made some interesting claims. And this is the interesting claim that was not just on their website for many years, um, but they also encouraged authors of all papers to reproduce this statement in their scientific publications. Okay, So the veracity, the accuracy, the truth of this statement matters. We go to readers in full. So UK Biobank is not representative of the general population. That is very, very true. 20 million people were invited to participate in UK Biobank, and around 500,000 responded. Right, so that's about um, 5%. So what do you think, given we've said on this slide, about all the different determinants of participation? Do we think those 500,000 people look the same? No, they don't, and Biobank will admit that, absolutely. They're different from the general population on a variety of socio-demographic, physical, lifestyle, and health-related characteristics. There is a clear healthy volunteer selection, and as a result, they say it's not suitable for deriving generalized disease prevalence and incidence rates. Okay, so that's, that's a clear statement that makes a lot of sense. This population is extra healthy, so if we look at that population and ask how many of them have diabetes, well, it's likely to be lower than the general population. They then go on to say, however, the large sample size and heterogeneity of exposure measures allow for valid scientific inferences of associations between exposures and outcomes that are generalizable to the wider population. Now, there's nothing in the last two days, at least, where we've talked about sample size as being in any way related to bias. And I don't think we've talked much about heterogeneity in terms of bias either. We've talked about heterogeneity in terms of increasing um, estimation error and reducing heterogeneity to increase precision. So yes, they go on, we advise that where appropriate, well, <laughs> you can guess what my view on that is, Publications that use UK Biobank data should include a statement basically to declare these, you know, prevalence incidence estimates are not generalizable, but our associations are all fine. Do we believe this? Well, if we have a look and have a think, perhaps we can work out whether there might be a few flaws in the, that, that statement. So in a, pr a prospective observational study, Participants obviously precede, participation obviously precedes the outcome. So that's, that's reassuring. It's not like a case control study. 
But we've already said in previous days, if something precedes something else, it has temporal precedence. It's a potential cause. So without knowing anything else, we can immediately say, well, actually, it doesn't necessarily matter um, that exposure is before participation, uh, because we can still imagine there being a correlation there. Um, the, but at the same time, we've also just said that there are a, a huge number of different determinants of participation. So if any of these happen to cause the outcome, any of health, education, belief, psychology, and personality happen to cause a health outcome, let's say, I think they probably do, then we've got a backdoor path. So if there's any correlation here, we will have M bias. We will have a situation that looks like this. And in fact, of course, when we, see, when we see it this way, we're reminded exposure doesn't need to cause participation. You only need there to be some common reason that connects the exposure and participation, and some common reason that connects participation and the outcome for there to be M bias. So if C1 or C2 include any of those things that we've talked about, health, education, beliefs, psychology, personality, and economics, then we can expect there to be collider bias, M bias, and biased associations. So the statement that there should be no problem looking at associations seems, from the theory of it, a little bit naive. The scary thing is that this problem even occurs in randomized control trials. So I, I certainly remember in the past people have said, I give up, I'm never going to do observational research again, I'm just going to do randomized control trials. Well, you're not immune um, from bias, collider bias, even in those situations. Because you can imagine a situation that looks something like this. You have some drug and some later outcomes, let's say cardiovascular disease. Um, but if the drug causes a symptom um, that is in itself caused by health, um, then, and that symptom is a reason for dropping out of the study, say attrition, so fatigue is a very common reason very common side effect of some drugs, very common reason why it might be difficult to continue to participate in the study, then you'll have um, a backdoor path. You'll have a backdoor path because although you've not conditioned on fatigue, the collider, as we remember from yesterday, you don't have to condition directly on the collider. You can condition on a descendant in order to partially condition on the upstream variable. So in the randomized control trial situation, because if we only analyze the full sample, and this is why you need to actually adjust the people who drop out appropriately, then you would end up creating a collider bias that was caused by a common, um, a, a common reason for dropping out. So what are we saying? If exposure and participation are correlated with participation, well, if exposure and participation are correlated in some way, and outcome and participation are correlated in some way, you can expect your exposure-outcome relationship to be biased. It's as simple as that. So we think that collider bias and selection bias is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. The degree to which the bias is there is obviously what matters. But to say there is no bias, is, well, it's naive. And very unrepresentative samples are likely to be the worst affected. So the one where participation is increasingly obscure, in a sense, increasingly um, different from your population, you're likely to get a larger and larger bias. And that is why, as well as this statement, we focus on biomass because they are famous as one of the world's most selected populations. There's studies that have been done by the Biobank team to describe how incredibly selective the population is. So does everyone now agree? Put your hands up if you agree with this statement that, well, the large sample size and heterogeneity should mean that there's, you can make valid scientific inferences from the association. 
Well, not even one person. I mean, this, this, this is the UK's largest, most well-funded cohort study housed in the top university in the world. Go on. You know, there's been, been thousands of, there's, there's over a thousand studies in, indexed on PubMed. I don't know exactly how much has been spent on the cohort. It's really hard to tell because there's loads of different funding sources, but it's a lot. Um, and you can go and you can look on Biobank and I tell you what, the website's nice and shiny and flashy. That's how to do your science, people. Well, I did that when I was preparing this lecture for the first time, um, three, four years ago. And I just thought, right, let's see. Can we spot some selection bias? And this is, a, this is an honest example. I haven't changed it because um, it's, as you'll see, it, it's, it's both good and bad for me. Um, what, I just kind of looked down the first page of recently published publications, and this one stood out. Sleep and cognitive performance. And I thought, ooh, sleep and cognitive performance. I can just imagine those being related to participation. Um, so let's have a look. Let's see what's going on with sleep and um, participation. So we know that sleep um, is the, the, the supposed exposure that's causing cognition later. What's going on with participation? Well, I just thought, hmm, um, it seems quite plausible that you could have something like mental health, illness, anxiety and depression. Anxiety certainly would affect your sleep. I can imagine that also affecting whether or not you participate. Depression would seem to affect your cognition. I can imagine that affecting your participation. So if that was true, now what would, what would it do? I drew some, some pluses and minuses. I thought, right, greater anxiety would mean worse sleep. Greater anxiety would mean less participation. Greater depression would mean less participation. Greater depression would mean less cognition. So what that should do is produce a bizarre inverse association where worse sleep seemed to cause better cognition. And I looked at the discussion and the conclusion. I couldn't believe it. Our results suggest that after adjustment for potential confounding variables, frequent insomnia symptoms may be associated with a small statistical advantage, which is unlikely to be clinically meaningful on simple neurocognitive tasks. So they found a paradoxical reverse association, which, because they couldn't explain it, they just said, oh, well, it's not really likely to be important. Well, it's, it isn't likely to be important because it's likely to be collider bias. Um, but they don't mention that. They don't say, this is to be expected in studies within UK Biobank. Um, however, however, it isn't as simple as that because actually, when you delve into the adjustment strategy, you realise there's a lot of table two fallacy going on as well. Um, so these are four different models, which is always a bad sign, I think, uh, especially when there isn't a, a sort of a justification for these, other than just saying, here's our unadjusted analysis, here's our adjusted analysis with some adjustment, here's some more adjustment, here's some more adjustment. And what you end up with, and strangely enough, they didn't really discuss this, you end up with sign switching depending on the, how much you've adjusted for. So this um, sign switch um, between what were we talking about, prospective memory um, or insomnia and <coughs> prospective memory happens only after you've started to adjust for more and more things. And you've got some of the things in the final adjustment, well, depression is there. So that would actually block my theorized, one of my theorized backdoor paths, but that was just one path. Um, but they also address for, let's have a look, sleep medication. Wait a minute, wasn't the exposure sleep? So we've adjusted for the exposure and we've chronotype, which is kind of the type of sleep pattern you are. I, I have no idea what these mean. Um, so we can't say this is a simple case of selection bias. We can say there's, there's a lot more going on here and it makes it difficult to interpret. That is a toy example in a sense. I'm not picking on these people any more than anyone else. Because um, fortunately, around the same time that I was um, preparing this lecture for the first time, this paper came out, which I think is one of the most influential and important papers um, of the last 10, 20 years, which you wouldn't necessarily guess 
by just the title or by reading it. Um, kaleidoscope when selection bias can substantially influence observed association. It's by Monaco et al. And what they do is they conduct some simulations within um, some highly selected samples, such as UK Biobank, to try and work out how much is the, is the selection bias likely to be doing. And they have this not as clear as it could be, but devastating conclusion. <laughs> The magnitudes of effects that we observed in our simulations are comparable to many reported associations derived from large but selected samples, such as between personality and cognitive functions, a range of physical and health outcomes, and between chronotype and years of education. So various things they're talking about. So such associations could be plausibly generated by selection bias. So they looked at a few different things, they did some simulations, and they found that what the literature had suggested could simply be selection bias. So they say studies in samples of unknown selection attrition mechanisms run the risk of provided bias and misleading results. And in, in our opinion, these important caveats should be borne in mind when interpreting these studies. Now, Mark and I passed this paper on to individuals within UK Biobank. And we said, you need to read this. And nothing happened. And we said, have you read it? Yes, we're aware of that paper. And so what do we do? Well, Mark and I have a bit of a reputation. <laughs> uh, we don't like being ignored, particularly when it comes to scientific things. So on one day, um, a few years ago now, I think, um, the Society for uh, Epidemi Epidemiological Research in America, remember, America are 15 years ahead of the UK. They understand collider bias, they understand selection bias. Right? They were doing a kind of Q&A with um, one of their senior individuals, Maria Glymore, um, and you know, any question is, is welcome. So I decided to submit a question to Maria. I said, can you help with something? Can you help with some with a confusion? Because from Miguel Olam et al., which is their book, I thought an XY relationship could be collider bias if X and Y are correlated with selection. But Biobanks say this on their website, there's no problem. What fine missed? And she replies, now bear in mind I'm tagging Biobank in this. That's not an accident. <laughs> she replies, well, I suspect there's no justification, it's just hope. Maybe it's true, maybe the bias is small, but that's an empirical question. Um, it will be introduced. Got evidence, UK Biobank? Have you got evidence for this statement? And of course, no reply. No engagement whatsoever. <clears throat> so we kind of stir the pot a little bit. Thanks, Maria. Hopefully Biobank will be able to provide evidence of their hopeful claim that cloud bias is not generally a problem. And Mark adds, I have it on good authority, they know it's problematic. Well, they didn't do anything. No response. No response to this conversation. No change. This paper comes out in The Lancet by our American colleagues, Hees and Westreich, author, what do we call it, Morpheus of the Table 2 fallacy, <laughs> Westreich. UK, Biobank, Big Data and the Consequences of Non-Representative got in the Lancet, and they essentially say, there's this weird claim that's made on the website, we, it's wrong. Nothing happens. Still on the website. What do I do? We're starting to get pretty annoyed, right? So, I was invited to give a seminar at Oxford. The uh, Northfield Department of Population Health, which is one of the hosts of UK Biobank, um, it was an introduction to causal inference, but I couldn't resist including this material. And I said, please remove this statement off your website, because it's not scientifically true, and I don't think that's good. That's my diplomatic way of telling them. You've got to remove it. I think I actually said it's embarrassing. Um, our American colleagues must think we don't know what we're doing. And here's what they did. They changed it so that the statement said this. 
Please note, UK Biobank is not representative of the general population on a variety of socio-economic, physical, lifestyle and health-related characteristics, with evidence of a healthy volunteer selection bias, details of which are published elsewhere. As a result, UK Biobank is not a suitable resource for deriving generalizable disease and incidence rates. Are we missing something? Because we've just told them you have a problem with associations. They've admitted the statement that there was no problem with associations was inaccurate, clearly, because they've made changes to their website. So they have made a scientific admission this is a problem, but they don't say anything about it. So Mark and I have spent the last few years continuously repeating this issue as often as we can. I was on a, um, okay, I was on a reviewing panel. Yeah. I was on a reviewing panel for CR UK, and every time there was a study that came in using UK Biobank, I would say, well, they haven't mentioned the selection bias and what they're going to do about it. And the thing that bothers me about this is that you can get better estimates by trying to correct for the selection bias. So if you hide it and you don't talk about it, then every single study that comes out without correcting for that is going to be biased. You are corrupting the scientific literature willingly. This is the reason why I'm stood in front of two ridiculous umbrellas being recorded to post this on the internet to say Biobank is committing, well, they are corrupting the scientific literature willingly. What are we going to do about it? And it's not just me and Mark ranting at the front anymore. We've seen Monarfo et al. There are now more studies that are coming out. The Americans have spotted, not just the Americans, people are spotting. Biobank is a great resource to start to understand and describe selection bias. I'm not sure that's what the participants originally signed up for. I'm not sure that's what it says in their information sheet every year. You know, keep giving us data so that we can produce interestingly ridiculous associations. No, you know, these are all interesting in their own different ways. I'm going to read a few quotes from each of them. This is the first one. Our results suggest that future UKB and analogous cohort users should exercise caution when examining associations between established risk factors and mortality outcomes, as poor cohort rep sample representatives might influence and material, materially some estimates. So they did some simulations. It confirms what we've seen in Monarfo et al. This is a huge and influential study in, I think, Nature Communications that came out after we saw a flood of rubbish around COVID-19. And they said, results from samples that are not representative of the target population should be treated with caution by scientists and policy makers. Because actually there were some early studies using UK Biobank to look at what's going on in COVID-19 and without any adjustment for the selection because nobody says there's a problem. We're just pretending it's not there. There are no shortcuts. I like this. Identifying the causes of selection bias are mandatory. If we want to get things right, we can't just bury our head. There is another paper I should mention, actually. Um, this is quite an amusing one. It was in the BMJ last year, where some of our UK colleagues decided to examine the relationships of certain common associations as observed in Biobank and observed in the Health Survey for England to see how different are they? How much is there likely to be selection bias? So this is actually that empirical question that Maria Glymar said you need to answer. And somebody has gone, gone on and answered that. I'm not going to comment on whether they were um, they're working with Biobank or not. Um, it's a perfectly, um, it seems to be an independent study. It's published in the BMJ. And they conclude, despite a very low response rate, risk factors associations, oh, risk factors, um, <laughs> in the UK Biobank seem to be generalised. So perhaps I have spent the last five years, banging on about a problem that doesn't exist. Well, certainly true that the main 
they, here are some of the results that they present. But the main result that they present, which is what um, unadjusted um, ratio do you get from UK Biobank, and what unadjusted ratio do you get from the Health Survey for England, are oh, almost exactly the same. That's good. If we look at sex, this is the relationship between sex and cardiovascular disease. UK Biobank has nearly four times higher hazard. Health Survey for England has around a two times higher hazard. Um, hang on. Seem to be generalizable. Almost double the effect size. Are we okay with that? If so, why? Aren't we supposed to be trying to understand what these relationships are in a way that can then influence policy? Well, luckily, Maria Gleibold was on the case. Because she actually said, I hope everyone reads the results in this paper, but ignores the conclusions, since those don't reflect the results. And here's her killer. There's a wonderful thread. She says, the good news from Batty. For every comparison they present, the effect estimates were the same sign. <laughs> the bad news, if you use the UK Biobank estimates to make public health decisions or prioritisation, you'd often make the wrong decision. So very radically different interpretations of um, the same numbers there. And um, still no apparent response to these, these comments, these communications. I wanted to end by just saying Biobank's Success um, and importance continues to roll on. During COVID, it got a lot of money. Um, and this is from the Amazon website. Biobank UK or UK Biobank are now working with Amazon um, in order to do the COVID-19 research. Amazon is kindly donating its distribution service um, in order to ferry back and forth samples. This makes you wonder, is it just too big? To fail, to fail? Is it politically too inconvenient to admit what's going on? I'm going to leave that to all of you um, to think about because I have to say, me and my American colleagues find it hard to believe now that this is just naivety and this is just lack of awareness. There was plenty of discussion that has been happening. We have been prodding them as hard as we can and prodding them again and right now. Um, but still, there is a, all it needs, there is a problem with selection bias, we'll spend £100,000 developing the best possible sampling weights, everybody please use these weights, previous studies that have been published, please be aware there may be some selection bias. Bang, you're on course to doing the best you can. The longer this goes on though, the worse it looks for everybody. So, um, <laughs> We'll call that bit to an end. <laughs>